This is High School Not So Much a Musical, a podcast that takes you on a ride through the peaks and valleys of a high school journey. Here are your presenters, Nitin Jaladanki and Ayush Agarwal. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of High School Not So Much a Musical. Today, we're joined with Mr. Adam Carlton, who owns his very own business, Pink Panda Holdings, and is an expert in things like cryptocurrency, NFTs, etc. So, Mr. Carlton, could you talk about your business, Pink Panda Holdings, what it does, how you went about founding it, where it is at now, etc.? Sure, I'd be happy to, and thanks for having me today. Um, so, yeah, maybe just a, a little bit of a, a backstory myself and how I got exposed kind of to the world of uh, cryptocurrencies and. Um, you know, I actually was a very early uh, adopter of Bitcoin. Unfortunately, I'm kind of one of those people that had the pizza story where I had a uh, had a, a pretty substantial amount of Bitcoin and uh, it was I think it's like 2009, 2010 and it quote crashed, right? It went from, I think, $12 to $3 and I needed money for whatever reason. And I said, well, this isn't going anywhere. Sold out on it, and here we are. You know, many years later, now we're actually seeing another what I would call a market correction. But I, I really believe uh, that over the last few years, I, I came to the belief that you know, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, all these edge case uh, technologies are here to stay. And what really I, I became incredibly interested in um, in again the last two years was the rise of decentralized finance. And um, almost just from a, a personal experience in trying to get onto decentralized finance, if you've never done that before, uh, it's an incredibly challenging um, experience for even a, a technical person, for someone who understands it. Um, you know, you have to connect into these very uh, difficult uh, browser extensions and you have to move things through wormholes and you have to um, make sure your gas settings are right there's all these really bizarre things that are very specific right to crypto so um you know we uh th there was a group of uh of, uh traders and developers in particular there was one developer that i'm uh, pretty good friends with and we decided to take the plunge and we wanted to develop a um a wallet and a decentralized exchange and kind of that vision has morphed uh over the last uh seven eight months to where we're realizing that the the gap in the market is is there just isn't a friendly um access point on a mobile device right for a wallet that is cross-chain that you know that makes things really simple for the end user that's fun and intuitive and so that's where we landed is, is we're really trying to build a uh a mobile application, right, that allows, uh, you know, someone who's new to crypto or doesn't have a lot of time to deal with the intricacies of it to access DeFi, to access NFTs, to access the metaverse, all these amazing cutting edge um, use cases that, that have started to really develop in the last uh, year or two. Yeah, definitely, because I like one thing that I picked up on was that you're trying to make it easier for like the end user. And that kind of like brings up this video that I was watching a couple of years ago where this group of people, this was like maybe 2016, they were just trying to go one day just solely off of Bitcoin and trying to solely work off cryptocurrency, but they don't really know how Bitcoin and how cryptocurrency works. So before I get to like my my actual question, I was just wondering if you could explain to the listeners what is a cryptocurrency where is it actually stored because it's not a physical token even though like people make metal bitcoins and say that they're selling them around it in reality it's just in where it's decentralized finance right so where exactly is the token how exactly do you trade it for anybody who just doesn't know what bitcoin is or cryptocurrency as a whole is right now Sure thing. I'll, I'll I'll do my best at this. This is always a, a challenging question is, you know, what is cryptocurrency? What is a blockchain? And I feel like analogies and metaphors are, are pretty good to help people understand. So I have a, a bit of a uh, metaphor that I put together that, that people have enjoyed is um, imagine you're on a, um, a neighborhood block, right? And there's a hundred uh, families on that block and 10 people took, you know, in each household or each family and you've got a thousand people, right? And there are several um, uh, reputable grandmothers throughout that block. And each of those grandmothers has a big bound ledger, right? That they uh, write down every time someone transacts. So say you 
give someone something, they write it down. You take something from someone, they write it down. And uh, everyone trusts the grandma and everyone can go look at their books and everyone knows exactly what transactions took place. And no one's gonna, you know, try to mess with grandma and the other different grandmas that are gonna basically, you know, sync up with each other. And that's like that collective um, uh, ledger is what the blockchain is. It's, and, and no one is ever going to be able to take that book away. So that's like an immutable feature of a blockchain, right? That's what they mean, immutable. It can't be censored. So basically, um, you know, you'd have to uh, uh, take out grandma, right, to do that. And no one's going to do that. So those are the the uh, kind of core components of what creates um, uh, trust in a blockchain is that everyone can see it. Everyone knows what the transactions that are taking place and basically without, you know, draconian measures, it cannot be stopped. Um, now, there are some countries that have taken more draconian measures, uh, you know, China, some other uh, uh, countries have taken more draconian measures. But in general, I think that, you know, the world is, is going to accept adoption of that. So how does that relate to cryptocurrency? Well, cryptocurrency then is... Uh, effectively, it's a uh, if you think you have this blockchain, right? All these different addresses across a blockchain, um, you uh, access a portion of that that you own. So that's what happens with Bitcoin. Is if you uh, have purchased Bitcoin, and we can talk about mining in a minute. But if you purchased Bitcoin, um, you can access that Bitcoin. What you have is is you have a a, a number of that in a wallet that you access through um, an encryption key, right? So it's distributed through that entire blockchain, like, you know, you and and your your access to what you have reserved on that or what you own on that, what you have custody on is, is reserved and, and controlled by that address that you access through a private key. And then why does that have value? Well, it has value because much like um, any asset out there, whether it's a US dollar, whether it's apples, what have you, is, is people set a value on it because they believe that's what it is worth. Um, now, uh, there's clearly a, a, a highly, highly speculative nature to that. I think that's why we see these you know, major swings, right, in um, the price of Bitcoin over its life. But in general, because Bitcoin is a what's considered a uh, uh, deflationary or it is a, a asset right that is not going to ever um, exceed its maximum value it's seen oftentimes as a potential hedge against inflationary currencies such as the, as, as the US dollar now I know I threw a lot out there but, you know did any of that make sense to you guys can I clarify that for you yeah I think that like analogy with the grandma in the neighborhood makes a lot more sense now because like a lot of people there's just so much like fake stuff going around saying that you can like trade these metal bitcoins and stuff like that that some people just get like confused but i think that for anybody who doesn't understand it this is like a really good example and it kind of leads me to my next question which is how exactly is bitcoin going to be adopted in the real world because going back to that video that i was talking about they were really struggling to find anybody who would be willing to let them use bitcoin to make any sort of transaction they needed to have like a middleman for everything and they were like trying to buy a plane ticket or a hotel i believe and like they had to find some sort of loophole where they could add something to their wallet and why, why do you think it's taking so long for companies to kind of accept Bitcoin? Because they're seeing that so many people are after it now. And like everywhere that you see, like over Reddit, if you just type in the stock market, half of the people are talking about cryptocurrency and stuff like that. So why do you think it's taking so long for the like general world to kind of get around this idea of cryptocurrency and that it really is a viable option? And then my second question is, um, how exactly do you create a cryptocurrency and mine for it? Because I remember watching on TikTok, there's these people who will buy like this rural landscape and then they'll build their own mining facility where they get tens of thousands of computers and they supposedly mine cryptocurrency. So how exactly does all of this work? Sure. So um, my take on it is, is that when Bitcoin originally came out, right, it did have a digital currency, you know, perspective on it. And I think what happened is over time is that um, it was it was seen that it wasn't really that kind of asset, right? It's more like digital gold that has a limited, 
you know, amount of, uh, of uh, there's a limited amount of gold in the world, right? And, you know, if you have mined some gold, you don't take that gold and go into, you know, the convenience store and say, here, I'll give you this chunk of gold for whatever I want, right? You convert it to something else. You convert it generally to US dollars. So I think what Bitcoin has morphed into is more a store of an asset value over time, right? As a, as a, a hedge against um, inflation and as kind of the original, you know, digital asset that came out there. And so what I see uh, uh, has happened over the years and especially more recently is, is we're starting to see um, stable coins are really starting to now uh, take that uh, that middle ground, right, where you can actually come into and out of uh, cryptocurrencies very quickly and retain a pegged dollar, a pegged, um, a pegged value to the US dollar. Okay, so there are a number of different stable coins out there. And that's probably an entire podcast around, you know, how stable coins work, right. But what that is, is again, it's a it's and you're starting to see uh, governments now looking at this, um, uh, you know, the US dollar actually or the US government just released a um, uh, a report on, you know, where they're considering going with a stable coin. And it looks like if the U.S. government, being Congress and the executive branch, decide to issue a U.S. stable coin, which I think is very likely in the next few years, then that's their take on it, right? It, it, it creates very seamless transactions when you have it in a, uh, a stable coin versus, again, Bitcoin that has volatility, that's not terribly liquid, that has, you know, all it, you have to create some kind of unique mechanism to transact it versus uh, coming in and out to a dollar. We all understand that, right? Um, there are other asset classes out there that have tried to kind of step into that transaction type role. But I'm, I frankly think that that makes the most sense. People understand the dollar. Uh, they understand what one means against that. And they, and, you know, it's a lot harder to explain to someone, well, that's going to be 0. 0.000002 Bitcoin, right? How do you, how do you price that? How do you understand that? Um, to your second question around mining, so Bitcoin was the original, uh, what they call proof of work miner. And the the simplest way to explain this is basically you're running a, um, a, a you know pretty substantially powered um, CPU. Uh, and what it does is is the way the algorithm is, is set up, and I'm not a highly technical person, but this is my understanding of it, is that um, there basically is a, a random, um, uh, uh, allocation of a Bitcoin when you hit, you know, uh, that uh, kind of that that wheel that you're spinning through this mining process, right? So you're constantly mining, mining, mining. Oh, you received a Bitcoin, mining, mining, mining. And there are ways that these can be aggregated. Um, to your point, it is a, a, a real large consumer of electricity. And so what we're starting to see is um, other chains uh, are, are moving to uh, or starting as more of a proof of stake concept, right? Where instead of actually having to mine this cryptocurrency, instead, what happens is you have a number of different um, nodes or, or validators out there that hold and uh, create a, um, a transaction point for that cryptocurrency, right? And so what happens then is, is they are rewarded for creating the, um, creating the stability of that network and that's the way that proof of stake mining operates, right? So that's the difference between proof of work and proof of stake. And I think that there are very few proof of work cryptos um, coming out nowadays because, again, you know, um, uh, there's there's definitely a lot of uh, concern about how much uh, you know power, especially Bitcoin, consumes. I like what you said at the end of there about power because uh, a lot of people don't realize simply how much electricity takes up because. Uh, as Nathan mentioned, like people create entire, almost like Bitcoin mining factories in rural areas in order to, you know, maximize their Bitcoin output. And that obviously requires a lot of power. And I've also heard of people like essentially letting their computer pretty much run like 24 seven, just to keep on, keep on mining Bitcoin. And like for the 1% chance that they might be able to buy a Bitcoin, uh, which is obviously not very energy efficient. So where do you think, uh, you know, this problem is going to uh, progress in the future. And how do you think like this 
specific problem that Bitcoin has of energy consumption, specifically in, in the mining portion, uh, how do you think that will be resolved? How do you think, like, oh, wh what do you think are potential solutions to it? Are there any current potential solutions on the market that, you know, people are kind of adopting, et cetera? Yeah, I'm not really sure how, you know, in the long run, right, that Bitcoin power consumption is resolved. I, I think what we are seeing is, you know, there's a lot more discussion around, it, especially as, you know, climate change becomes more and more prominent. Um, I think what you're seeing in the short term is, is to what you mentioned, is it's going to um, areas that have excess power, right, um, that have, you know, a lower cost for their power. So you'll, see, you know, Texas picked up a lot of, uh, a lot of um, miners when, when China banned mining. And I know that um, where I think Kazakhstan is the second um, uh, largest miner out there, but there's, there's still a conflict with that, right? You know, you, you see, um, you know, issues in Kazakhstan with, um, you know, they were, they were consuming too much of the power from the grid and then that caused problems. So, uh, maybe, you know, the answer longer term is we find better ways to produce power. Obviously, you know, solar gets cheaper and cheaper and more productive. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how that challenge with Bitcoin is, is solved, you know, over the long term. Now, when you look at it as a, kind of percent of global power consumption, it's still fairly small, right? But they you know, say, oh, this is the, this is the uh, consumption of a small country or something like that. It's not insignificant. So yeah, I think that, um, you know, that that's a, a problem that, that does, you know, someday need to be solved. And it, it's kind of an indicator of just in general, like how do we stop looking at um, electricity as an endless source of power that we can just, you know, consume freely like this and, and adjust for that. So I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that. I know how it's being addressed today. I just don't know how they solve that in the long run. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree. And like one of the things that this whole conversation that talks about, about like cryptocurrency and everything like that is like personal finance as a whole, right? Because these high schoolers who are like directly coming out of high school, they don't really know what cryptocurrency is they don't know how to trade crypto they don't know how the stock market works and this is something that like if i use remembers when we very when we first started this podcast back in like august of last year we were talking with one of the investment advisors about how the stock market works and how exactly the stock like how high schoolers can get into the stock market so what exactly do you think crypto can bring to the high school community right now? Because there's like one person, like only one person that I know from my grade. Um, Sid, if you're listening, shout out to you. But if he he's one of like the only people who's using crypto and maybe like trading crypto. So how exactly can high schoolers get involved into crypto? And I was going to ask you something about NFTs, but I want to save that for part two. So I guess yeah. that, so just how can high schoolers get involved with cryptocurrency as a whole? How can they start trading? And where exactly can cryptocurrency take them into the future? Because just as you said, when you bought the coin in 2009, it was going nowhere. It actually crashed. But then over the long term, it like it, it went up a crazy amount of money that like nobody can even imagine. So how exactly can high schoolers take this power that cryptocurrency has and harvest it for their future? Yeah, that's a that's a excellent question, and you know I have uh, a couple of kids that are high school age, and I talked to them a little bit about this too. And so my son got interested, and I said, "Well, listen, don't don't put a dollar into any of this until you go out and understand some basic investing principles, right? Um, you know, time value of money, and what is compounding interest, what is dollar cost averaging, right? Those are concepts that." You know, you should understand for any asset that you potentially look at investing in, and and cryptocurrency is a you know it's it's not terribly old, right? It's highly speculative, it's highly volatile. So you know, uh, I kind of equate it to um, almost like technology penny stocks, right? You know, some some will do extremely well, but many 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 of them will fail. Um, so you have to understand what you're getting into. Now, the beauty of being um, young is you have an entire lifetime, right, for that for that uh, value to compound. So um, the same thing I tell my son is I say, listen, don't look at this as some kind of get rich mechanism. That is how so many people get destroyed in this, right? If I had just patiently bought and held, you know, and it doesn't that long of a time, right? I'm talking like 10 years. 
um, which really is a flash of an eye, um, you know, I would have realized much more significant, uh, much more significant return on that. So, you know, if you're taking that long view on it, if you understand what you're buying, if you're not looking for these, uh, these, you know, rapid short term returns, and, and that's an unfortunate part of cryptocurrency uh, that really manifested itself in the last year are, you know, there are a lot of tokens out there that are very much associated with, um, you know, a meme, an image, which is fun and we like that and it's it's cool and, you know, I understand um, the, the uh, attraction of that and we use that marketing at Pink Panda, but we never describe ourselves as a meme coin, right? We're, we're talking about utility. What's our underlying utility? So that's very important. So uh, I'm probably going to get a few haters from this, but I, I always call out Dogecoin as an example. Um, Dogecoin, as far as I know, still has absolutely no underlying utility whatsoever, right? But what it does have is a tremendous tribal community support from it, which is kind of being led by um, a bit of a disruptive person. We all know, you know how Elon Musk likes to uh, uh, swing his cryptocurrency stick around. But I don't think that's healthy. I don't think that's good for um, for people to to think that they can you know get rich on the next Dogecoin, right? They should be finding um, you know uh, assets that they think will have real value over the long term, and they should be able to understand why they think that will happen. And it's no different than any investment thesis. If I'm looking at you know um, uh, a stock right that's coming out, and I should be able to understand well why is this? Why do I think this is going to grow over time? So that would be my advice for someone who's very young: is is uh, you know understand it, research it, um, determine what your investment strategy is. And again, you know, I always think dollar cost averaging is a, is an amazing way to invest because what happens is that's how you remove volatility from an asset, right? If it goes up, you're buying. If it goes down, you're buying on a regular basis. And if you're not familiar with that, I, I, I encourage you to look it up because that's a lot uh, lot less uh, stressful way of doing this. Um, and then I would always say to someone who's looking at this and uh, that, you know, understand that you should never invest in anything more than you can afford. Right, uh, it, you know, understand that any of these can go down to zero. Right, you can lose absolutely 100 percent of what you've you've put into it, um, and that's the risk you're taking. So I think if you go into you know any investing, but especially a, a highly speculative asset class like cryptocurrency, you need to understand what you're getting into, and then and and I think that that's. Um, something that the industry as a whole has really done a, a horrible disservice to people on uh, uh, around helping people understand that. And, and instead, the industry as a whole has really emphasized the, you know, the moon, the rocket ship, the um, <laughs> the Lambo, right? Those kind of things just as a, as a more traditional investor kind of uh, make me a little itchy when I see them. Thank you so much, Mr. Carlton, for, you know, all your thoughts on the future of the crypto market, what exactly crypto is, and, you know, some tips for high schoolers trying to get involved in crypto. For our listeners, make sure to stay tuned for part two, which will be released in the coming days, and we will be discussing uh, NFTs and going more into the decentralized finance type of things. So see you all then. Thank you, and see you next time. That's our show for today. Now roll the credits. High School Not So Much A Musical is hosted by Ayush Agarwal, Nitin Jaladanki, and Rishi Sinha. Narration by Samhit Padala. Music from Louis Luang Relaxation Cafe, Tune Pocket, and Infraction. If you like the show, please recommend it to your friends and family. Thank you so much for listening. And-